Hello and welcome everyone. Um, today um, we are having our last luncheon for 2020. Um, can you believe it? We are almost at the end of um, 2020. I'm not sure if you have to be excited that finally this year of <laughs> a lot of, you know, um, surprises um, and some sort of unpleasant events it's coming to end or um, we sort of contemplate and think that um, uh, where did 2020 is gone um, we are almost towards the end of it and um, it was almost like fast forwarded to um, um, almost December so um, in today's session we've got Daniel Deng um, talking about data self-service and um, we're just going to have a very um, sort of a short intro, but Daniel, please um, go to the full end and let everyone know what you do and um, also about yourself and your hobbies and interests. Um, it doesn't have to be something so formal. And I think that's the type of thing that usually we kind of connect with people. And then that way, when we have um, sort of a common interest and share um, a similar, you know, um, in, not necessarily idea, but ha having some sort of a um, common ground, then we can connect and learn and um, know more about each other. So a little bit about you, Daniel, and um, before I get into that, just for, um, we've got a few um, new audiences, so just um, a quick recap on um, what is um, Analytics Roundtable. We call it art, um, art community, and um, of course we have to call it art because we've got so many fantastic members that they are um, the uh, master of their craft. Um, so it's, um, I think it's um, doing justice to our community and the collaboration that is happening um, in our community. So um, art exists to drive the positive evolution of data profession. Um, and as Daniel is gonna um, taking us through the journey of your um, sort of your journey of the data journey and how you got into the data, I think um, it's quite still a new and young profession and this, the, the major of um, sort of uh, interest in a lot of businesses. Um, some businesses thinking that they are doing data, um, you know, already well, but um, in the eyes of, you know, customers or um, the data scientists within the business, it may not necessarily be the case. So I'm sure you're going to tap on those um, uh, aspects as well. So we, we are here to make sure that um, we are covering, uh, we are connecting the data professionals together to, to each other and um, creating a um, sort of a safe environment to be able to make mistakes and learn from each other. And um, also an opportunity like today to present your knowledge and your experience with your peers and bounce back ideas. Um, the, this space is data focused, so it's ask and answer. Um, unless you are participating, posting questions, asking you know, questions or sharing you know, a very interesting um, um, topic or a post or a video like what you did, um, Daniel, the other day on a, on a fun Friday, um, so uh, then the community is not going to be sort of a moving. So it's all up to you how much you want to get engaged and how much you want to get value out of um, the art community. So enough about us. Um, let's get into our um, wonderful speaker today. So Dan, Dan, um, we've got um, Daniel today. Um, Daniel, you are a data architect at Lendy. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we want to um, um, talk about how the data team and other businesses units work together um, effectively and enabling each other rather than sort of uh, being a roadblock along the way. So uh, without any further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to you, Daniel. So if you want to um, try to share your screen, and I'm just going to stop sharing yes, my well. screen. Cool. All right, I'll share my screen here. Yep, we can see it. Great. Cool, nice. All right, so thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, Huria, uh, for your introduction and Sean uh, for having me here. Um, so um, welcome to um, the Data Analytics Roundtable. Um, and I'm honored to be here to share my experiences with uh, data services. So let's get started. Um, so the session will be around half an hour-ish um, or maybe 45 minutes, and then we will leave some time for Q&A after that. Um, so my name is Daniel and um, I'm working at Landy currently as um, a data engineer. And um, so throughout my career, I've done a lot of backend development and then transitioned into engineering and analytics. Um, and I have a lot of, um, you know, sort of experience to share with um, how the transition works and, and 
um, you know, how I felt with, um, you know, how engineering team and data team works together, but that's like quite another topic. Um, so I also do some coaching with software development and data engineering as well. Um, and this is my LinkedIn profile and feel free to get connected. It's always good to get connected and, um, you know, um, sort of talk about the business, talk about, um, you know, the trend, talk about technologies and talk about anything. And um, as Hura said, um, you know, with interests and things I like to do outside work, there's a lot and I'm happy to adapt more. So um, please reach out and then um, we can do something fun together. All right. So um, before we get into anything, um, let me um, sort of rephrase what Hura has already said. So the overall goal here is for the data team to um, become an enabler for the other business units to answer the business questions they need to make their decisions. And um, instead of being a blocker where uh, for most of the business questions, they have to come to the data team to get an answer for. And if there are so many questions going to the data team, then um, your answer to the questions may be subjected to the prioritization of the data team work. Um, so let's see how we can achieve this. So before we get into that, um, some short disclaimers here. Um, I'll be mentioning quite a few tools in this session and I'll share my personal experiences briefly with those tools and how I felt and um, you know when to use them, when not to use them, but um, that is only from my own perspective and i'm a big believer of right tool for the right problem so you have to judge for yourself whether um, the tools are um, fitting into your purpose or not and um, i use a lot of images um, from google images or some public images so um, i don't want to sort of like use any image without quoting where it comes from um, so these are the disclaimers and um, so a little bit of the agenda, we will go through how do we define service in this context and what is a data service and what is um, the data self-service. Um, and also there will, uh, there will be tools and stacks uh, for just different business units that I have um, experienced with. Um, and, and then these tools um, are the center of data self-service. So essentially we want to enable them to use the tools in the area of their ex expertise, regardless whether it's finance or it's marketing. Um, they have a lot of tools that are, that are designed for those purposes and we want them to use the tool to um, answer the questions for as much as possible um, without having to go to the data team. And then we're gonna talk about a little bit about the the role of the data team. So if everyone is answering the questions by themselves, so what does data team do? Um, and the latest one would be um, some pipelining tools that helps us achieve um, this data self-service initiative. And let's get started with service. What is a service? So in this context, I would say service is something that takes an input and gives you an output. And that's what we call a service in this context. Um, so a restaurant as a service takes your time and money as input, but will output um, you know, good food and good drink. And that's kind of like what a uh, restaurant provides as a, as a service. So Landy, where I work, um, so we are a service that accepts um, your documentations, relative related documentations and produces a loan that will help you, um, you know, move into your dream house and get customer happiness. So API service is obviously, um, you know, you get a request and you will get a response. Um, so what is data service? What are you sort of inputting and what are you outputting? So in data service, it seems like we don't have any input and we're asking for something. So this is the uniqueness of data service. 
which is for an end user perspective, we're not producing anything and we're not in inputting anything, but we're um, getting some output out of it. Now, um, a lot of people will say data service is the data team itself. So um, it's half the truth and I, have, like, I partially agree with this. And let's actually look at the brief history of data team. So data team doesn't exist in day one for most businesses. So how would the business start? So in, in the initial stage, there will be a product team and there will be a developers team. So the product team will go to the developers team and say, we, we need feature A, B, C. And you please um, develop these features for us. And then, um, you know, you got a very good um, application and you go um, online and then um, you get customers, you get revenues and the company grows and everything is happy. So happiness so far. And then as the company grows, um, you know, um, let's say sales team um, is now asking some questions about how sales are doing in different um, you know, locations and, and in different, um, you know, time series. And in that case, they would need to know these um, insights to support their decision on how much resource they would put into each location for the next quarter, for example. Then developers are not purely developing features. They are responsible for answering some uh, business questions to support business decisions from different business units. And this will get worse and worse. And in the end, um, developers will be too busy answering questions from the business units um, than doing what they are supposed to do, which is um, developing great features for the product and creating more value for the customers. So how do we solve this problem? Now, this is where data team comes in. So data team come either is a new team or comes out of a developer team and they are solely responsible for answering business questions so that dev team can go back to, um, you know, developing features and maintaining, um, you know, current features so that um, the product keeps evolving without having to be subjected to um, the number of questions um, asked from different uh, business units. Now, as the data team grows, the data team will start to figure out some um, common patterns or some regularly asked questions by the business um, team. So in that case, what happens is that uh, developers uh, in the data team started to uh, make some charts and make some dashboards so that with the most frequently asked questions, um, you know, they don't need to go to the data team because they're well defined and they're very automated. And um, you just, you, um, you're given an account um, in say Tableau or Power BI or any platform and you can look at these questions um, as for as much as you want without going to the data team. Um, but at the same time, there will be still ad hoc business questions from business units. Um, now, this is a prototype of data self-service, which is saying, hey, as long as we can automate as much as possible um, what is there, um, then you don't need to be subjected to our prioritization um, and you can just answer the questions right away. Um, but the reality of a data team, of all the data teams that I have been in, um, in to, throughout my career um, is not, is something like this. So essentially we're saying that, uh, it, you know, uh, we will get a lot, a lot of requests from um, dashboarding and reporting, but we will also get a lot of um, requests from business units, um, like rent ad hoc requests um, to support their uh, daily business, um, you know, activities. 
So there are two problems with this one. Um, the first one is capacity problem. So in people's mind, uh, data team is so, sort of like a group of resources. There will be human resources, there will be um, you know, assets and, and there will be computers, all these group of resources and it will produce charts and insights, dashboards, and then we have a brilliant future, um, data-driven. So that's where people start to claim that we are a data-driven company. And what that means is in my humble opinion, um, we are making a lot of our decisions based on objective facts instead of instincts. Um, and it's meant to be um, sort of like for the, for the benefit of the, the company growth. Now, there are problems here. Um, finance, HR, sales, marketing, they're all data-driven and they all want to know some insights. And if you're in um, you know, re retail business, then there will be warehouse and there will like how much we should stock for the next um, you know, few months and things like that. So then what happens is that everyone is asking questions or requesting dashboards to the data team and the data team would not know um, which questions to answer or which dashboard requests to react to. And this is the capacity problem. But even more serious problem here is what I call the expertise, uh, expertise problem. So the expertise problem is this. The business units probably know something in their area of expertise. Like finance, uh, they may need to know EBITDA, they may need to know cost of goods, and um, you know marketing will be bouncing rates, CTR, which is click-through rate, I guess. Um, and then uh, sales was, would have their own metrics and, and measurements of um, you know KPI performance and, and everything. But the thing is, data team are not experts in this area. Data team knows about SQL, Python, Spark, Airflow, they know about these things. Now there's a gap there. And when business people talk to data team about, um, I want to have some questions answered or I want to create a dashboard, um, in the end, normally it ended up um, being sort of like data team tries to understand um, the business units, uh, what they're talking about and vice versa. And in it, and it could be something like, guys, let's speak English. So with these two problems, um, before we go to a potential solution, um, let's remind us with the overall goal. So our overall goal is that we want um, data team to be an enabler and not a blocker, which means that we want all those questions or most of those questions to be able to be answered uh, within the individual business units and not is explicitly coming to um, data team for an answer. So let's come back to the original problem. So what do the business units need? Actually, they need two things. One is dashboarding and reporting. That's for regularly asked questions or frequently asked questions or well-defined questions. And there are some ad hoc questions um, to support daily decision making. And these are all very tied to um, each area of expertise, say finance or um, you know, marketing, telesales, et cetera. And so our goal here is to as much as possible um, get themselves, the business units themselves to um, get the charting done, get the dashboards they want done and um, get most of the questions at, on an ad hoc basis to be answered by themselves. And in that case, we wouldn't have the expertise problem as much because they within the team knows exactly about the area of their expertise. So um, then we need to think about um, tech stacks. 
So um, in the tech world, we have tech stacks like we have mean stack or ELK stack and, and all these kinds of stacks. So tech stacks is basically um, a group of tools that works well together to solve um, a particular problem. And um, we in the tech world, we have tech stack and in the business units, they have their own stacks and I call them tool stacks. So according to my um, previous experience, these are the tools, uh, but these are very limited subset of tools that I know of that uh, different business units may embrace. So finance, they are experts in spreadsheets and for a good reason, by the way. So um, they will have some model that is pre-built to um, accept an input and then put it in VBA or um, you know Power Pivot or Power BI, and which is very good BI too, by the way. Um, and marketing will have amplitude, will have Google Analytics and um, you know um, Mixed Panel. These are very good tools to um, to replicate or or to retell the story of the whole customer journey um, and drop off rate. Um, you know, in a certain funnel and things like that. So it's very good tools. And um, if we can enable them to use all the tools they are, um, they're comfortable with, then we are on the correct path to data self-service. And telesales, obviously um, we have a CRM system and we have a call list to call, but with these, um, you know, let's say we have new customers and re retention customers and the retention customers are those people who are already customers. And normally customers can be um, classified into, let's say, um, you know, uh, plat platinum or um, gold or, or bronze, um, all these different levels, depending on uh, the level of interaction with the business in the past. So these are something that we do down the line in the data warehouse or in, in the data team to do the classification of each customer and feed it back to CRM system because they don't want to go to the data team and say, hey, here's a list of the users. Can you give me each individual user's level or classification? Because with different classification, they may uh, talk differently to um, different people when calling them. Now, the last thing is data science. So data science, they're like, they're very technical and um, they know exactly what they want. And so we don't need the data to be um, pushed anywhere else other than the data warehouse. You can have a schema with high quality data in data warehouse and leave it to the data science team and the data science team will just come up with all these fantastic tools and then um, they will train a model and, and that will really create value for the business. So with different business units, they have very different data destinations and tax stacks and reporting tools. Um, and we would like to enable them to use their tools to solve their problem instead of um, saying, you know, preventing them using Excel, or preventing them using an Amplitude. And we say, hey, we have a data warehouse and we have a Tableau or Looker report and let's build whatever you need through that report. Um, so there are pros, pros and cons there, but let me give you an example here. Um, in finance, we have a term which is called depreciation and that's the declining of values over time of a certain asset. Now this is um, a very finance specific accounting specific term and no one else in the um, in, in the business will uh, sort of like look into this area. And so it's a finance only problem. And if you look at the spreadsheet, um, you know, Excel um, or Google Sheets, you can see different formulas for um, calculating depreciations. And there are different rules there. And these are very battle proven. So many companies are using that. 
and um, all these edge cases has been tested. So all the groundwork has been done in the depreciation report, uh, in, in the depreciation functions. And all we need to do is provide um, you know, the raw data in a certain format so that they can apply these functions and then they can get the depreciation re result either with a charting tool in Excel or a Power BI. Now, in this case, for example, we can um, have the data team do the same thing. But first of all, you need to learn about what depreciation means and what different depreciation logic um, is talking about. And then after understanding it, we're going to build the same thing to um, in our data pipeline to calculate all these um, you know, depreciation um, figures. And in the end, we're going to have another probably ticket in Jira or something to make sure that this thing works in dev and staging. And before the, uh, after that, we will push that prod. Whereas if you leave this whole thing to um, accounting team, they can do it in a matter of like a day or two. And it's a very good example of why we should be an enabler and then getting the data in the format that they want instead of building um, all these, reinventing the wheels uh, by ourselves. And you can see that with these functions, accounting teams, they are, they are very familiar with these tool, uh, with these rules on how um, you, know, you can uh, depreciate um, an asset. Whereas data team doesn't know about that. And that's an ex expertise problem. And there will be the same with um, you know, sales and, and marketing. And um, so let's continue. Data self-service is basically um, providing the right data to the right people at the right time to the right place and enabling them to use the right tool to solve the problem as quickly as possible as and as solid battle proven as possible. Now with the, let, let's dive deeper into, um, you know, each one of them. So right people. Um, now as disclaimer here, um, this is not really um, something in the real world. This is my imagination, um, admittedly, but this is to illustrate the idea of the right data to the right people. So um, in order to achieve data self-service, you don't need to give the whole data set of our business to every single business unit. For example, finance wouldn't need PII information um, to do any um, of their finance work. But this, again, this is hypothetical. It may be wrong, so it's case by case thing, but um, this is just an illustration here. So customer service, um, they don't need any potential customers. They only deal with customers that are already customers. Um, and for tele sales, they only need leads and they don't need the existing customers um, or until you are talking about like um, retention customers, that, that's something else. Now, um, marketing, you don't need any transactions that is happening within the business. And data science, um, you don't need PII. You may or may not agree with that, but this again is a hypothetical rule um, that illustrates what is the right people with the right data. And more data is sometimes very confusing to uh, the business units. So give the business units what they really want, instead what they really need instead of everything. And um, so right time. Um, different un business units may require different cadence um, of, you know, um, data. So for example, if you give weekly data to finance, should be enough. Um, and again, this is hypothetical and it may change, um, you know, case by case. But customer service, it needs to be real time, that definitely. So if um, a customer does something with our system um, in the past five minutes, customer service needs to know that. 
and telesales um, and marketing and um, data science, they probably only need daily data instead of re real time data. And the more frequent and you know, the more up to date we want to make um, the data, the more um, development effort and maintenance effort we have to put in and also monitoring and alerting effort um, that we need to put in to make sure that the data flows in a higher frequency. So to the right place, um, so obviously finance, um, spreadsheets is one of the very good um, you know, uh, places where um, finance can achieve self um, data self-service. And then customer service will have ticketing system like Zendesk or something like that. And uh, telesales will have their CRM system. It can be Salesforce or any, any other CRM system. And marketing, um, I see a lot of marketing people using Amplitude and you know, Mixed Panel and also Google Analytics in a very professional way. And, and they can achieve great insights um, with just a few mouse clicks and great dashboards as well um, to understand how a, a lead or a potential customer uh, com is converted to a you know, customer and uh, what's the conversion rate uh, during the funnel and uh, drop off rate of each individual um, steps and things like that. Um, data science, as long as you give them, um, you know, a data warehouse schema, they'll, they can do a lot of the things by themselves, um, like hooking up Jupyter notebook and then um, training by uh, Spark ML or any, uh, you know, PyTorch or, or, or um, TensorFlow or anything like that. And the right tools, again, um, you know, after the right destination, they are enabled to do things on their own with their favorite toolkits. And that will be VBA and Power BI for finance. Um, and then for data science, it could be, um, you know, PyTorch or, or, yeah, all the different tools. So we're talking about a revolution or a transition from a traditional data pipeline, which is from uh, you know extracting data sets and then transform them and load them into um, the data warehouse and then um, doing transformation, um, probably transformation, but still sometimes it's just a direct um, you know charting from the analytics platform. Now the only problem with this is that it prevents. Um, it prevents data self-service to be happening and it encourages um, all the um, business units to come to the data team and ask for information or ask for um, dashboard and charts. So we would like to do a little bit differently. So we want data to flow into um, you know, the right destinations as we explained here. Um, and as long as we can achieve this, then the self-service um, is sort of right at the corner. Now, the problem is how do we make sure that the right data flows into the data destinations? And so let's talk about, um, so before we talk about the data tooling and that sort of thing, let's think about what does data team do? Now, um, before we talk about what does data team do, Here's a little sort of, um, you know, interesting fact. <clears throat> so in 1990s, excuse me, <clears throat> in 1990s, um, Walmart has done um, a data analytics project and they are answering a lot of questions on um, the transactions and the sales. One of the questions is what is best sold with what within one transaction? So you can think about, okay, hypothetically, I would say, um, you know, our t-shirts are best sold with trousers or something like that. And now the result is very astonishing. The result is saying among all these billions and billions of, I mean, millions and millions of products, beer and diaper, they're the most coupled, um, you know, tr combination. And why is that? There's a lot of hypo hypothesis in that. 
But anyway, so um, the most popular one would be um, husband is going to um, you know the uh, the supermarket and buying some beer, and then they pick up a phone and then they call the wife, and the wife will tell them, "Hey, pick up some diapers too." So they will do that. So in the end, there will be um, some interesting facts, and actually, uh, Walmart has actioned on it. So they've put diapers and beer together on a shelf or something like that. Um, I haven't read the whole story, but you can actually check it out. It's very interesting. Now, what does that mean to um, like connect this interesting fact to um, what the data team do? Because the first thing that data team would do is still answering ad hoc analysis questions, but those like those questions were, which is like cross-functional team and also very advanced um, and requires technical uh, skills, then in that case, data team is still responsible for these kind of questions. And um, create and evolve domain modeling. So um, as we can see, like, you know, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, lexicons or different words um, that we use to express the same thing, like last name and surname, and date of birth and birthday, and these kind of things. So data team can actually drive um, to have a domain modeling for specifically for the business so that every single business units are talking about the same thing with the same phrase. And also it needs to be evolving because the business by defense, you know, Nowadays, all businesses needs to evolve. Um, and um, so the do domain modeling is not a one-off thing, it's actually evolving. And we also need to, um, as a data team, we will maintain some core uh, business metrics and that's cross team. So um, different teams will look into um, last quarter's revenue or something like that. Um, and those are the core business metrics. and obviously every single business um, will have a different set of um, you know, business metrics that are shared across the whole company. And pipelines and monitoring and alerting, and this is the whole, like the, the, the engine of data self-service. So the whole data self-service wouldn't um, have been um, you know, realized until we can achieve piping different data into different destinations. And there are data lineage, data governance, and anomaly detections, and also training of like, you know, uh, say, you know, how do we go about, um, you know, what is a fact table and what is, um, you know, um, a dimension table. And these kind of concepts are very good, even, if, even for um, other business units for their own tools, it's very good you know, um, sort of thing to know. And there are a lot of trainings that um, data team can do. So now the core of the problem now becomes how to transfer data or how to transform and transfer data to the right destination. And there are a lot of tools out there and um, I'm just naming a few of them and um, expressing my own um, ideas on how to use these tools and what's the use cases. And these use cases are limited and, and they can be expanded to other things, um, but here are they. So five trend is something that I've used before and I personally use it for um, you know, database to database transactions. So let's say if you have a Postgres database in your application, and for some reason you want that application data in your data warehouse as a raw schema so that you can do all the transformations on top of that. So in that case, you're talking about a relational database to a relational database. And um, because Fivetrend knows um, you know, the source databases so well, um, they actually, um, you know, do a lot of optimization on, um, for example, how do I um, manage like changes of an existing role and how do I manage deletions of a role and all things like that. And they 
deal with it in a very um, you know professional way and elegant way um, and they have other things as well they call um, APIs from some certain sources for example Salesforce um, if you have Salesforce data that you want to pipe into your data warehouse then um, you can actually just um, hook up um, Salesforce and give the API key to Fivetran and Fivetran will just pipe the data unstoppingly to your um, data warehouse. So this is Fivetran and there is um, a similar tool called Stitch and Stitch um, is having a richer, in my humble opinion, a richer set of, um, you know, uh, sources. So they go to different data sources and pipe data, um, you know, and spots and stopping in a streaming manner um, to your data warehouse. And so this is what they said on their um, website. So we deliver the data to the leading data lakes, uh, data warehouses and storage platforms. So with these two tools, you can um, pretty solidly and pretty um, consistently pipe data from external data source into your data warehouse. But the problem is not everyone is using data warehouse in the, uh, in, in the, in the other business units. They're using amplitude, they're using um, spreadsheet, they're using other things. This is where other sets of tools comes in where they no longer um, only pipe things through data warehouse, which is mainly used by the data team. Instead, um, they will like pipe things into various different platforms. <clears throat> so without segment, if you want to achieve data um, self-service, then you have your app to talk, you have to you know, make your app talk to uh, Facebook and some messaging and data warehouse and, 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 and a lot of other places. So if, um, the, if the marketing team said, I want Google Analytics, then your application needs to um, you know, talk to Google Analytics and, and then give the events out. And then if they decided to use Mixpanel and Amplitude, then the application needs to go there as well. And there wouldn't be any historical data because the historical data is not there anymore. Um, whereas with segment, you're basically um, using your application to talk to segment and say, hey, here's, here are all these events. And segment will say, hey, I keep all your historical data and I can replay the data to any data source and you can add data source um, as you want. So that includes like Amplitude, um, Facebook, Google, and Zendesk and, and all the destinations that you can think of. And so we use segment in uh, Landy and it's serving us really well. Um, and by the way, it also goes to Snowflake um, and other warehouses as well. So it's a very good tool for piping events. Um, so with events, I mean, like staying on a page for a certain period of time or visiting a page or clicking on a UI button and or some mobile app swipe and all these kind of events, they're very good, um, you know, well handled by segment. And also backend, um, you know, backend uh, events can also be sent to segment and they aggregate the user uh, with certain keys and they will map out the whole user journey. Like the user has clicked on this button and then the backend received that and then um, returned a 401, but then he tried again and then it worked. And then um, he listed the whole um, item list or something like that. So the whole journey can be mapped out in some analytics tools um, like um, Amplitude. And there are similar tools, in, which is called Zapier, which is, has a different um, design principle. So Zapier, um, I like to use them as um, a trigger. So what I mean by that is that 
um, some of the finance teams say, hey, we want spreadsheets, so we want Google, um, Google Sheets, for example. Then we have a pipeline that um, you know, uh, pipes some uh, data from one place, doing some transformation and drops it in uh, Google, in Google um, Sheets. And then you can actually, with Zapier, you can actually trigger an action to post it into a Slack message and say, hey, now you have your data. And now with the data flow, there are some of the data flows here and we're running out of time, so we have to be quick. So some of the data flow here um, that we use in our real time, one is, um, you know, uh, segment. So if you have mobile apps, you have servers, you have uh, webs, you can actually just pipe them in and then you can go out to Zendesk, you can get out to emails, analytics platform. These are very good for events, but wait, there is not only events in our data world. There are other things like databases and Kafka and, and all, all these other types of things. So for example, with messages like Kafka, you can use Kafka Connect and Kafka Connect is a tool um, and it's open source, um, you can use it to pipe data from and to Kafka. And data flow to any other data source or from any data source, um, you can actually use tools. There are multiple tools here and uh, the most well-known well one will be Spark and uh, specifically Spark streaming. And you can stream data from one uh, way to another. And um, then at the end of the day, architecture actually serves you, not the other way around. And um, we introduce a new pipeline to um, the architecture just for um, you know, a specific purpose, not for the sake of architecture. So you can have a, a, like as a complicated architecture as you want, but at the end of the day, you want to achieve that the right data is flowing to the right people at the right place so that they can use the right tools to solve their problems. And pipeline, by the way, are not everything. Just keep it simple because as you can see, there's this is only one thing that um, you know a data team can do and data team can do far beyond that. So please keep it simple and um, you know do not uh, put it as a, like, do not use a tool just because um, you know it's a it's a industry standard and it's a best practice. Think twice and think about why you introduce this tool and this pipeline into the architecture. So at the end, I would say that the end goal is that data team is an enabler by um, piping the right data into the right uh, to the right people at the right place at the right time. And then uh, let's not be um, a blocker for other teams. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. That was great. I think um, uh, your um, insight about Walmart uh, ignited a few conversation in the chat. <laughs> so um, as a mother of a three year old, I know that um, sometimes when you send a dad to get nappy or a formula, they uh, get everything but that. <laughs> so it's interesting to see that from a data scientist uh, sort of a point of view and how you get tracked in the shopping center. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got a few questions, Daniel. If um, we've got about ten minutes. Yeah. Um, one of them is, uh, what data um, lineage means? Oh, data lineage. Okay, so data lineage means um, that we would like to know where the source data comes from when uh, we have some data um, analytics, um, you know, happening. So, let's give a very good example here. Um, we have what we call a data pipeline, which is um, a definition of how we get, you know, data from which source, and then how do we do transformation, and how do we come to, um, you know, the destination with an enriched data set. And for simplicity's sake, let's um, think about a streaming uh, example, which means that the same row, the same number of rows will be in the destination as the source for simplicity's sake. So 
Um, then we have something called a pipeline uh, run, which is a unique um, identifier to um, you know, the particular runtime of one execution of a pipeline. And in the end, we will have like a destin in the destination, we would need to know where the source data is coming from, which source row is it coming from, and which pipeline run is it enriched from. And so in the end, at the end of the day, what we want is we want to be able to explain why these these data are correct in the you know in, in the destination, and we are able to reconcile to the raw level of the raw data set. I hope that answers the question. So Daniel, if I want to um, sort of simplify it extremely and butcher it down, um, does it mean that it's a mapping tool from the origin to the destination and cross-checking back and making sure that you actually transferred all the data of, and keeping with their integrity and their accuracy to the destination? Yes, you got that right. Thank you. Um, we got a few more questions. So I'm just um, kind of going and um, rushing through them. Yeah. Um, also, we had a question, um, if um, any insight about the tools that you mentioned, which of them are free, um, which of them you have to have the um, subscription to be able to access them? Okay, um, I, I wouldn't have time to, it's a very good question, by the way, um, I, I don't have time to uh, walk through every single individual price model. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about, for example, um, as an example segment. But before that, a disclaimer, I'm not representing any of these tools, but according to my, um, like, according to my experience, I will share about the pricing type of thing. So um, if you want, Daniel, uh, just to save some time, um, yeah. because we've got more uh, other questions. Sure. Um, once I put the recording of this session, yep. if you had some time, maybe you can um, put some sort of a little table or something as a comment to that post. So oh. if anyone wants to get more information, yep. uh, I'm sure um, you've been always generous with your time. They can either reach out to you or um, just post um, their questions and that um, yep. recording. I'm happy to do that. Um, so the next question is any tool for data governance? I think, I think um, we co covered um, briefly data governance in our previous um, lunch on that um, it's sort of an insight and outcome of a data analytics is as good as the input. Um, so how can we actually have um, data governance around um, all these tools? And is it like a, a sort of a helicopter view that's kind of control everything and making sure that the output is actually accurate and insightful? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so before that, I probably um, will quickly answer the pricing problem. Um, so a lot of tools there are um, there because um, they're solving a very generic problem um, in a battle program way and tested um, so many times. And it's actually saving a lot of dev effort. And devs, um, especially in Australia, is very expensive for a business. And if we can have someone managing um, uh, some process for us um, that takes data from one way to another, um, like um, in a consistent way and, and stable way, then I would say that it's significantly lower than any, um, you know, if you would have, you know, throw one dev, uh, you know, designated into that. Mm -hmm. But okay, so back to the problem of data governance, um, it's, it's quite hard to answer this question, to be honest. So um, as we know that in testing, uh, in the world of testing, application testing are those who are like, it's the logic testing. So basically we're assuming that if you give me the right input, then I'll give you the right output. And that's what we call um, application testing. And we can unit test that. And we say this input will result in that input. Whereas data um, in the data world, testing is different. So when we talk about run a pipeline, we're talking about um, getting data from one source and doing some transformation and then put it into, into the next source. And in that process, um, you're actually doing more than that. So you're actually verifying the source. So let's say if we say a source, we are um, assuming that the source is um, having a uniqueness on um, some key, for example then uh, what happens is that we wouldn't run this one, uh, the, the pipeline, if 
um, the uniqueness is not assumed. So the data governance in your in the sense where the question is coming from uh, started even before the pipeline. And we're saying we have a bunch of um, you know assumptions for the input table, and if the input is not satisfying that, we wouldn't run our pipeline. And in the end, we will have to cross check, and that cross check is like really case by case. For example, if you're saying, um, let's wrangle some data from raw um, you know, data to monthly data by team, then we will say, okay, uh, but in the end, um, the, the output of the total sales should be the same as the, the original total sales. So this kind of cross check is really like, you know, sort of pipeline by pipeline and, and transformation by transformation. But the data governance that I meant is something different, but let's go to the next question probably. Sure, um, and um, it may feel like we are rushing a little bit, but we will get to all the questions. We can have a separate post in the coming days. So um, not to worry if we haven't covered um, the topic, you know, 100%. Um, yeah. So the next question is from James, very interesting one. Um, and is, have you faced any issues with providing self-service data, such as, you know, being in a position that the um, teams avoid self-servicing? You've already provided um, the dashboard, um, but they don't actually use it and they um, still continue to make ad hoc requests. Yes. Um, and I would say that it's, it's a tough situation to be in. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's a process problem. So if it's a process, I think it's more a process problem than a technical problem. So in that case, um, I think it's, um, you know, communication is the key, that's one. And second, there must be a reason why they are not using it. Either um, they don't know that they exist or they're not equipped enough technically to do something, then we need to optimize um, the way we do self-service with them. Or third, they just, simply don't want to use them for um, lack of confidence on, on, on their own sort of, um, you know, reporting skills or something like that, then we can also work on that and training would do. And also at the end of the day, we're talking about data um, self-service as in saving 80% of the time or like, like this is a random number, but saving uh, most of the time for uh, the problems that can be answered autonomously by the teams themselves. And we're not talking about you know, solving 100% of the problem. So I think, um, Daniel, back to your point about that from a business side of um, um, the story, um, I guess it's important for the business and for the end user to see the value of using that tool. If there is of any value to them, and as you mentioned, it's gonna be saving time or increase the productivity or efficiency, and also on top of that, if they feel comfortable using it. So sometimes it's a, a lack of you know, training and education and actually, yeah. um, you know, and it's, it's not necessarily between you know, individual teams. It might be just a culture of the company that they don't have resources to um, provide relevant training and support for the business. So then they get to hang of it. You know, and from, for example, when you are going to um, the, the finance and you know, I'm talking about it from my I'm sort of an area of expertise, the finance, um, yeah, we use a lot of, you know, Excel spreadsheet, not because we don't like tools and I personally love technology, but most of the time, by the time that you want to convey the message to, you know, your business analyst or someone who is in, the, in charge, um, at the end, they give you the vanilla version anyways. <laughs> so yeah. all, you know, these um, business analysis and mapping and functional, non-functional requirement, you come to the end and it says, where are all these information that I've given you and I can't see any, any glimpse of it. Yeah. So I think um, um, it's a very sort of a slow process, what I'm trying to say, and long-term yeah. process. So yes. um, I guess for um, the, the, the other scientists and the business, they shouldn't um, take this personally or get disappointed. Um, yeah. It just understand this is a sort of a snail pace um, you know, process that, um, and it's a quite new, the data uh, profession yeah. quite new, only 10 years or 15 years old. So um, we are all learning and adapting a, a new way and method of doing things. Um, yes. So um, as you mentioned, sometimes we may need to tap into our soft skill and see that how can I actually 
you know, even connect to this person in terms of understanding what's their requirement, what's their need, how can I add value, and yes. then go back and then implement the changes. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Maria. And that no worries. reminds me. I've got a few more questions, but I'm conscious of the time. So what I'm going to do, um, I will um, create a post specific to this um, luncheon and put the recording there. And then I'm just going to add the questions that we didn't get to answer as a comment. Yeah. And I, I think that way everyone can contribute and have you know, their view, um, point of view on the, and the questions and answer them. And obviously, if uh, Daniel, you had some time to get to those questions, would be much appreciated. Yeah, I will. And also one point that I added to your, um, you know, what you have said, uh, yep. which is really, um, you know, good insights here. So there is a natural gap between expertise, um, especially when it comes to technical expertise, which is transferable knowledge, um, wherever you go to, um, you know, what kind of industry um, is going to be used. Uh, whereas um, there are certain areas of expertise like finance, there's a natural gap. So <clears throat> I've read some article about why product managers and, and uh, you know, tech team leads cannot um, sort of like get along. And it's not because um, of like, I'm not suggesting that they have a natural gap here, but basically to be a very good product manager, your um, way of thinking and your even characteristics will be pushed into one way Whereas um, if you're a be world best developer, then your thinking, your way of thinking and your characteristics is on the other way. <laughs> and if the best meets the best, then there's a natural gap on the way of thinking and the, you know, the, the characteristics. But we just need to accept it and also willing to sort of fill the gap uh, slow, you know, slowly. And as you said, it's like a snail walking process. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, as you mentioned, um, not every sort of a finance marketing person can be a data scientist and not a data scientist can be, um, you know, um, a sort of um, a, a everything. So um, it's that sort of a middle point that everyone bring their own expertise. And that's the art of collaboration to be able to hear someone, um, you know, and maybe not get too um, sort of precious or sensitive about our knowledge. And yes. just be open-minded that, that um, this person might not necessarily know the finance. And that's a challenging, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm guilty of it myself, that when you hear someone come and talk about, you know, changing uh, some process, you're worried because in the back of your mind, you have a lot of compliances, especially in the very highly regulated industry, as I'm sure you are aware of it. Um, and you are trying to kind of survive your day-to-day -day job um, of, you know, delivering to your clients. And at the same time, going through a change. So the whole change management process um, sometimes doesn't get um, sort of managed properly. And that brings a lot of you know, frustration in teams. Yes. Well, um, Daniel, thank you so much. As you can see, there has been a lot of questions. Uh, it was a very insightful, very engaging session. Um, it was very informative. And um, as I mentioned, I will post the recording of this session in the art community. Thanks everyone for joining us and please feel free to continue the conversation um, in the um, art and post your questions, make comments. And um, if you are interested like Daniel to present in our future sessions, please um, send me a direct message and uh, we can have a chat and organize it. Thanks everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you Haria, for hosting. Thanks, bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye. All right. Bye. See ya.